Today we're going to be talking about one of the tools that many of our successful businesses have used to, um, to grow and succeed, and more importantly, to build innovations that are making a difference for people here in Arizona and around the world. And I'm pleased to have with us today Andy Lombard from the Arizona Commerce Authority and Jameson Meredith from EY. Both of them are experts on the subject of R&D tax credits. And um, Andy is going to kick us off talking about um, what the R&D tax credit landscape looks like here in Arizona. Um, and then AZ Bio board member Jeff Singleton will introduce Jason Mer Jameson Meredith who will give us an overview of some of the things we need to know at the federal level, followed by Q&A hosted by yours truly. So with that, Andy, you wanna kick us off? Thank you, Joan. Welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Always happy to um, provide as much information as we can from the ACA. Um, I will couch Joan's expertise comment. I am um, knowledgeable and going to go through this uh, in a lot of detail and pr pretty much provide what you'll need to know, but our experts will also be listed here so you can contact, contact them directly as well. Um, so first of all, I wanted to just go through from a state level, uh, the purpose and framework of the RD tax credit program. Uh, first and foremost, it is to encourage Arizona businesses to continue R&D. Uh, we want to lead in commercialization, new technologies, and future growth. Uh, obviously, um, over a period of time, we would have loved to have grown this uh, program more and more and more. But as you'll see, it's kind of complicated, and it takes a lot of constituents within the state. Um, so to really break it down, there's two very important uh, components to the tax credit program in the state. Um, and I'm going to go through both. One is called the non-refundable component which is administered by the Department of Revenue. And the other is the refundable component, which is administered by us, the ACA. And I'll go through uh, the non-refundable first. So on the non-refundable, it was administered by uh, DOR, as I said, it was enacted in 1992 for corporations in 1999 for individuals. That's a pretty important thing that some people haven't realized that it is also for individual uh, tax credits as well. So if you haven't yet put your um, LLC or your corp corporation together, you can. Uh, further enhanced in 2011 relative to additional credits via universities, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. The key elements um, on the non-refundable, again, non-refundable tax credit currently equal 24% of the first $2.5 million, which is $600,000, can qualify. These expenses need to be qualifying expenses. We'll go through that a little bit. And then plus, 15% of the qualifying expense in excess of 2.5. This is just a way to gauge the amounts uh, in all of that. Uh, for taxable years beginning um, 2031, this is out there uh, from a legislation perspective, the tax rate will reduce to 20,000 and 2.5 million dollars, which is $500,000 and then 11%. And the reason that is, is just in, when you do these laws and these legislations, they're balancing it out for uh, future years as well. That could e easily uh, change as we move along. Uh, have no updates on that, but it could change. The tax credit is based upon the feder federal regular computations for qualified research expenses. So you have to look at what the Fed requirements are. I'm glad we have that presentation or at least some of that coming up. This includes wages, supplies, rented and leased computers, costs, uh, contract research expenses to name a few things. Um, I think um, the team is going to go through this, but that section in the IRS is section 41 for full details. Um, they'll probably get to mention more sections as well, but just want to make sure everyone knows that that's where that's coming from. I mentioned the university tax credit in the state. This was uh, changed, um, I think it was 2011. So uh, university tax credits amount are allowed if tax pickers make basic payments to a public university. Uh, equal to 10% of the payments that are in access expenses over the base credit, base credit amount of up to 34%. These apply to ASU, UA, and NAU only. Um, what that means is that the community colleges are not um, uh, participating in this, nor are the private schools. These are just state uh, funded schools. The amount is administered by, again, Department of Revenue on this. Uh, the taxpayers must first apply for a certification for research payments 
and then they can get accepted. We do that work um, when we accept those um, because our criteria at the ACA is similar to that. So it goes through the ACA for acceptance, then it goes back to AOR and being accepted. ACA may not certify research payments representing more than $10 million in a total university tax credits for a given calendar year. So we're maxed out for university tax credits at $10 million. Okay, so that's the non-refundable side. Um, in order to participate in the, refu uh, the refundable side, you have to be a participant in the, uh, the non-refundable side. And we'll go through that a little bit. So the ACA administers that. Um, this was enacted in 2010 to provide a partial refund on R&D tax credits. Again, it's partial. Um, and it's cool because it is refundable. And you could imagine this goes very, very quickly. And we'll talk uh, a little bit about that process. The key elements uh, for qualifying companies may be eligible to claim if uh, they are otherwise qualified as a non-refundable R&D tax credit. So first you go through and you get qualified as non-refundable tax credits and uh, their current year AZ tax credit exceeds their tax liability. So this doesn't help some companies that are still not yet paying taxes and you got to worry about that, but um, it, it's still very, very uh, productive for those that, that can qualify for it. ACA can approve refunds on a total on the refundable side of only $5 million in any calendar year. Again, that's $5 million of the refundable uh, tax credits to those that have already qualified in the non-refundable side and also have tax liabilities. The application process and approvals are on a first come first serve basis um, and can only be submitted on or after the first business day of a calendar year. This is again, legislation. Uh, so it's written into our um, laws for Arizona must be submitted electronically through the ACA's electronic application system. It's called easy. Um, I'll give you some details on that. And the 5 million cap in refunds is usually met within minutes. This is, something that people trigger on their computers and are ready to go at midnight um, on the 31st when <laughs> when they pop the corks and the uh, the fireworks go off champagne and, and so forth at 1201 that opens up so this literally fills out before we would walk in on january 1st the five million dollar cap and refunds is usually met again within minutes aca approves and determines the refund uh, process within 30 days we're going through that right now uh, we'll give some details on that for those that have uh, uh, submitted for that. So again, the key elements are meet the eligibility, must uh, submit the applications uh, before filing the tax with uh, ADOR. That's very, very important. Um, it has to be fewer than 150 full-time uh, employees worldwide. We wanted to, the, the, the state and the legislation wanted to target those companies, which is important to us. Complies with import, employer requirements for E-Verified. And if, if application is approved, um, pays non-refundable process fee of 1%. So basically there's a 1% uh, of the fee to just process all of this. Uh, refund criteria, 75% of the access credits uh, during the current credit tax year, and the remaining 25% is forfeited, uh, forfeited in the refund issued. $100,000. Uh, began in 2019 to maximize the company participation and the maximum credit refund uh, amount on the, on the certificate of qualification of the ACA is one of the uh, prior two criteria not met. So essentially what this is saying is that you're not going to get your entire amount. There is a small amount that will be refunded. Um, it's basically what we're seeing is up to uh, 100% or $100,000. So just to give you a kind of how that looks, um, when you roll it all and stack it, non-refundable with the refundable um, over the years. Um, and as you can see in 2010, those applicants were 53. Um, and just this uh, January 1st, we had over 100 thus far. Uh, what we do is we then go through and um, applicants are issued a cert certificate of qualification. And once you're qualified, meaning you met those requirements, um, we go and uh, start to uh, manage the, uh, the refunds through that. And again, we go up to uh, $5 million, which is shown into that. That's pending because it's, uh, we haven't issued the $5 million yet. And you can see the total R&D expenses uh, of applicants that have been issued a certificate of qualification 
it's been steady uh, pretty much. I think it kind of dipped a little bit and, and uh, we expect it to be pretty large this year. Uh, but it was 87 million last year to be probably over a million dollars we would expect. Um, super important for uh, the team on this call. Um, if you could, um, I'll try to copy this and let me just make sure I can. No, I can't. I'll, uh, I'll send it in another one. But um, if you go to the azcommerce.com site, um, forward slash incentive, and then research and development, or you could just search on it, um, you'll see all of this uh, laid out with applications. But I also just wanted to give you a concierge type of service that um, our program manager, Cindy Grogan, who's fantastic at this, can really help answer any questions and help you with specific needs while going through the application process. And they're here year round on that. They're, they're not just uh, uh, watching this uh, in December and January. So Cindy is at Cindy G at azcommerce.com. And I'm again, Andy Lombard, I'm at Andrew L at azcommerce.com. And if you do have any questions on that, uh, you can let me know and I'll be here to answer questions as well. So Joan, I think that's uh, less than 20 minutes. I went through pretty quick, but um, hopefully that's a good overview for the team on this. Thank you, Andy, that was great. And um, for everybody on the call, we're going to now switch over to the federal side because they are interrelated. And um, Jeff Singleton, if you would announce or introduce Jameson to the team. Absolutely. So welcome everyone. I'm Jeff Singleton. I'm an a, a executive a managing director with Ernst & Young here in Phoenix. Um, I've worked with Jameson Meredith for, for several years now. Jameson, Jameson <coughs> excuse me, is a partner that sits in our Dallas office and he's the leader of our tax advisory group. Um, so not only does he deal with the research and development credits, he deals with accounting methods, anything that, that would be um, outside the, the uh, annual compliance work that you may have from an income tax perspective, Jameson is your person to go to it with uh, all the answers that you could possibly want. Um, so like I said, I've worked with Jameson for a number of years on several projects, an incredible resource, um, and we have a great working relationship. So I'm going to turn it over to him, let him go through the federal side, because as Joe mentions, they, the federal and state are closely aligned and closely tied. Um, and then after, at the end of this, we'll turn it back over to Joan for our, our questions and answers. Jameson, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, and, and Joan, thanks for, thanks for having me. I was, I was thinking back, the, I think the last time I, I maybe spoke uh, to, to the AZ Bio group was when there was a grant program that came out of the uh, Affordable um, uh, Care Act 10 years ago, uh, 48D, which... Uh, was one of the uh, more exciting things probably when I look back at my career to, to participate in. Uh, so it's, it's good to be uh, in front of this group uh, again. I guess, you know, I had I, I, kind of some, some slides, but maybe, maybe to, to, uh, to level set just a little bit and in, in, um, kind of piggyback on to Andy, I'll, I'll maybe give you just a, an overview of, of the federal rules at section 41 and then we can kind of dive into some some more topics that uh, that uh, that I see, um, you know, kind of currently in the the research credit space. But you know, one thing in in, in Arizona, um, you know, I've 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 worked in this space for 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 a couple of de decades now. When you stack up Arizona to other uh, states, um, they are definitely the more uh, favorable. Um, probably have some of the, the you know, flexibility with the refundable and non-refundable pieces that I see um, across the country. So it's a great state to be located in and a great state to, to have your R&D investments in. Um, let me uh, share my screen real quick. So just, just to give a real quick overview of the, of the research credit. You know, the research credit for federal actually dates back, you know, another decade from Arizona. So it was 1981 when it was enacted. And it really is to encourage R&D spin in the US. Um, and when, when they define R&D, it's much broader than a scientist or an engineer would, would maybe consider R&D. Um, you know, really, you have to show that 
Um, one that you are trying to create a new product, a new process, um, or improve that product process uh, formulation or technique. So you have to be in that functional development um, space. You have to rely upon a science, meaning this can't be taste or cosmetic, that this is really driven through, you know, through a, a what we would refer to as a, a hard science. And then <clears throat> you have to show that there is technical uncertainty to the project, meaning, you know, I've never done this before. I'm trying to create a, a brand new device, a brand new um, uh, drug, um, uh, and I'm not sure I'm capable, or it could be as easy as, I know I can get to my end goal, but I don't know the appropriate design. Uh, that still would be technical uncertainty. And then the last, and this is what drives really all the cost and everything that we would attribute to the development is the process of experimentation. Um, so really everything from that initial ideation um, through prototypes, through simulations, up until you know, you've got a product that's ready for commercial um, um, aspects. So it's gone through you know, maybe, maybe FDA approval, um, all the way to it's truly ready to, to commercialize. Um, um, and all of that effort that goes into that is what you would want to capture from a cost perspective. Um, and just to give you a, um, uh, a quick, the way the credit works is there's actually two different calculations, but most taxpayers are using this alternative simplified where they capture their cost they have to look back three years to determine a base amount, and the amount over the base is gets a 14% credit. Um, so that's what kind of the mechanics of the of the federal credit um, are. Um, happy to to you know in the Q and A to to discuss that a little bit more in in depth if y'all have questions. Um, but you know to give kind of what I'm seeing kind of currently in the hot topics. Um, in, in R&D, you know, one of the things that we're kind of dealing with is under the tax reform, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, the research credit was um, kind of almost de-incentivized a little bit from a federal perspective. Um, so if back in 2017, when they were going, working through the major tax reform, you know, what was happening was, you know, one, it was a very rushed process. Two, they had a budget that they had to, to get under. So there were some things added to the, to the last part of that to really, from a budget perspective, to get under the $1.5 trillion um, tax reform that was passed. And it did impact, um, you know, the, 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 uh, um, uh, pharmaceutical or life science um, industry. You know, one, it, it reduced the orphan drug credit um, from 50% down to 25. And then the other thing that hasn't, um, hasn't um, gone into effect yet, but <clears throat> starting in 2022, your research and development cost, um, as well as your software development cost are no longer deductible um, for federal purposes. Um, so that those costs now, and they've been deductible, the, the original um, uh, code was section 174, was enacted in the 50s uh, that said your R&D expenses, you can either capitalize and amortize or you can deduct them in the current period. Um, so they're, they're really going back um, you know, 70 years and changing the, the rules here. Um, but starting again in, in 2022, R&D cost will no longer be deductible. You will, you will have to capitalize those. And if those costs are spent in the U.S., you get to amortize them over five years. If you uh, spend any of those costs outside the U.S., those are a 15-year amortization. Um, so, you know, this is something that, you know, when I 
kind of think back to, to maybe how this, this happened. I'm not sure if it was a number that made the math work um, because it's, to me, is very counter, counterintuitive to what, you know, I think what we want to, to occur in the U.S. Of, of these, you know, very strong um, jobs, innovation. Um, in fact, I'm not sure there's another country in the world that has a de-incentivation for, for development. Um, uh, so keep in mind that the rules are changing in the very near future. <clears throat> The one thing that might be might be the saving grace to this is this past fall, there was a bill introduced in the House um, by by two Republican um, uh, representatives. Um, very very aggressive bill, um, uh, but as you can see, what um, I think they're trying to tie this bill into is a potential. Um, uh, you know, COVID-19 um, bill package. Um, uh, so what this bill has in, and then, I mean, um, you know, it, it's uh, not sure if this will, this will make it, but I think it would be fantastic if it does. So one, it would re repeal that, that amortization uh, that kicks in 2022. Um, you know, when that came out, um, EY actually did an economic study um, on the impacts of that of that uh, of that bill or that 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 rule, and um, starting in 2022, we estimated that there would be a job loss of 24,000 jobs each year, and then in five years that would uptick to almost 60,000 jobs. Um, so again, not something that um, plays into kind of the, the, the tunes that you hear from, from, from Washington now. But the other things that, that um, this, this new bill would do is it doubles all of the research credit percentages. Um, so that 14% that I mentioned would go up to 28%. Um, it would double the ability for small taxpayers to offset its, their research credit against payroll taxes. So back in 2015 under the PATH Act, they allowed small taxpayers to essentially get an ability to get monetize their research credit through an offset of payroll tax. So that currently sits at 250, but this would double. It also expands the eligible um, taxpayers in this space. Um, it's what is, is very interesting and, and probably interesting for a lot of y'all is it introduces a few new items. Um, so a new credit up to uh, 10 and a half percent against income for domestic manufacture of APIs and other um, medical uh, countermeasures. And then it also introduced a new 30% um, investment credit um, for uh, manufacturing and equipment um, of, uh, in the U.S. Um, and then it also provides, a, again, a refundable um, uh, component for your pre-revenue um, uh, development companies. Um, uh, so again, <clears throat> this is something that was introduced, I believe, in October. Um, you know, if uh, hopefully it would get tied into, you know, the next uh, Corona or, or COVID um, um, package, um, but maybe it, uh, maybe it survives and, and we can, well, I'll talk a little bit about Biden's um, uh, tax policy, um, uh, but this would be a, a great win for, um, for, for you know, the, the folks on the, on the call here. So um, the other thing, I guess, to, to give y'all an update is, is, is what are we seeing in kind of the IRS um, audit per, uh, uh, landscape? Um, so the research credit has for, for, for as long as I've been um, working in this space has always been a, an area of focus for the IRS. 
Um, uh, they, you know, continue to say that it's one of the more prevalent um, tax issues um, that they see in, in exam. Um, and it's, you know, there, there's a lot of factors that, um, you know, one, it's really hard to define R&D um, just given how innovation is done in, in just a multiple different ways um, to really provide guidance to, to, to you know, uh, fit that, that in. Um, but in early um, last year, they kicked off a, a campaign. Um, so, so the LBNI, the Large Business and International Division, um, a few years ago went to this campaign strategy uh, for audits, um, where it's very targeted, very focused on certain risks, as opposed to very broad audit techniques. Um, so the campaign in R&D, they've, they've kicked out, kicked off. Um, uh, what they're trying to do is they know they're spending a lot of time, both on their side, as well as the taxpayers, going through these exams. So they're trying to, to understand what they can do better. Um, they recently had a call with um, all of the major um, accounting firms and some of the large um, uh, R&D uh, specialty practices to, to um, get feedback. Um, you know, a lot of the feedback is there's not consistency from one exam to the next. Um, and can they introduce more safe harbors um, that taxpayers could take advantage of to um, really limit the, um, the exam to those high risk and not what we'd say is kind of that core R&D that really should qualify for this, this incentive. Um, one, of those, um, one of those safe harbors um, that a lot of taxpayers had started to take advantage of is what we refer to as a, a, a safe harbor that leverages gap R&D or what is, is referred to as ASC 730. So there was a directive that was issued um, in 2017 that allowed taxpayers to um, piggyback off of their financial statements. So if the financial statements um, reported a research and development in their PL or noted it um, uh, a footnote or noted it in its financial statements, um, then, then taxpayers were eligible um, for this, this uh, application of the safe harbor. And what it what it is is it's a very mechanical process that walks your your financial um, cost R and D cost down to the eligible cost, and those eligible costs would be put into a safe harbor. That if you're able to produce some very limited documentation, the IRS should not challenge it. Um, so they've learned over the last three years um, of some nuances that they didn't anticipate. So they recently updated um, um, uh, that goes in the fact of 2020 um, uh, new, um, <clears throat> new requirements. Uh, there's a little bit more documentation that's, that's required. Things like, you know, an organization chart, um, you know, some documentation around internal controls um, from a financial statement um, perspective. And then it really limited, and what they were having problems with is um, software development. Um, so they really limited the ability for only software that is sold, um, leased, or marketed. Um, so any of that internal use software, they've, uh, they've stripped out. Um, the other um, directive that is out there are safe harbor, and this has been out for, for a number of years and hasn't been altered or impacted, is there's a safe harbor for clinical trials. Um, so if you have clinical trials, you're able to accumulate those costs um, and basically put them into this safe harbor. If you sign an affidavit that these are eligible clinical trial costs, 
again, the IRS should, should, should uh, accept that without, uh, without any challenge. Um, so that's, that's another one um, that um, uh, you know, everybody you know, who is doing clinical trials should be, uh, should be aware of. Um, maybe touching a little bit on, on what we might see in the future. Um, you know, so there's a number of different um, uh, policy priorities for, for Biden. Um, probably became a little bit more um, applicable because of the results in, in Georgia now. Um, but, you know, one of the things that for him to be able to achieve a lot of the policies he wants to put in place around healthcare, you know, an, an expansion or, or increase in the Affordable Care Act, um, climate change, um, infrastructure, that there is going to have to be some revenue raised. Um, so <clears throat> these all will, will, will probably be paid for as much as possible through an increase in, in the tax rates. Um, so one of the things that you know, he's, he's mentioned is to move the corporate rate back from 21% from to 28% would create a $1.3 trillion. Um, so that's a, probably there's, there's numerous other things in the individual rates that um, potentially are, are raised as well. But <clears throat> when you look at um, some of the more incentives in, in policies, one of the things that is noted is um, uh, in, in his plan is a $300 billion um, you know, incentive for R&D and breakthrough technologies. Um, so whether that's maybe the, the piggybacks on some of the, the, the bill that I mentioned before, um, um, or, you know, there has been several, you know, bills out there around patent box and other incentives or an increase in, in R&D um, rates um, that potentially could be on the table um, if, uh, um, if there is a, a tax policy or package out there. Um, so <clears throat> hopefully we'll, we'll see some good news um, in the R&D space. Um, and then the last thing is, I just wanted to note that from a federal um, as well as global is, you know, the R&D seems to, is, is often the, um, um, you know, the, 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 the credit or the incentive that most people or most taxpayers are maybe aware of, but there are numerous um, other incentives out there um, uh, within your, your capital expenditures and employment um, and sustainability, um, as well as just from a global perspective. Um, you know, I mentioned how, how well Arizona stacks up from the states. I wish I could say the same for the U.S. The U.S. probably rates usually annually in the high 20s, low 30s, um, as far as the incentives they provide in R&D. Um, but there is a lot of incentives if you have um, operations outside the U.S. that um, are much more lucrative. Um, and a lot of them, especially in your European countries, are refundable. Um, so even if you're not a taxpayer, um, there's, there's cash to be had. Um, you know, maybe one of the, the, the examples is, is Germany. Um, so Germany, starting in, in 2020, is the first year that they provide a research credit. They've never in their history provided a research credit. So they're trying to be, again, more, um, more aggressive and, and encourage um, taxpayers or companies to, to do their R&D. And then they had a cap, a refundable cap of 500,000 euros, but because of COVID, they doubled that. Um, so they quickly um, kind of saw the benefit and now it's a, a million euro refundable annual credit. Um, but again, you know, I see a lot of our, our clients um, who are maybe taking advantage in the, in the U.S. because that's where a lot of the function is, but you can get, you know, France has a very lucrative, Chile has a very lucrative, there's a lot of incentives out there around the world.
Joan, I think, uh, I think that, that ran about, uh, about my 20 minutes. That was perfect. Jameson, thank you. And, um, you know, for everyone, I want to, before we go into the Q&A, I really want to thank both Andy and Jameson for, um, you know, taking a complex situation and a complex set of questions and, um, you know, synthesizing it as well as they did. Um, and um, I do have Andy's slides that I'll be able to send um, out to everyone th who was registered after this. And Jameson, may I share yours also? Yeah, I'll send you an updated one. But yeah. Perfect. Um, because uh, that way they, they don't have to try and, and survive on screenshots, which I know <laughs> people do. Um, so with that, I'd like to open it up for questions um, and looking at the chat. Um, if you have a question, you are welcome to put one in there. Um, but one that I wanted to touch on just as we um, get going. Um, so Jameson, you talked about you know, what, what's going to happen with the new administration. And of course, we've got a 50-50 Senate. Um, the Democrats still control the House, although not with the numbers that they did in the past. Um, so there is going to need to be more collaboration. As you look at the various items that we talked about today as far as changes, if we were going to, and, and I know EY doesn't do this, but AZ Bio does meet with our elected leaders and talk about what's important to our Arizona um, innovation community, what would be some of the things that you think would be most impactful for us to talk about on behalf of small business? Um, from a, from a small business, um, perspective, I think, you know, one is the extension or expansion of the PATH Act. So giving the ability to monetize their credit. So, you know, that 250 to 500 or even something larger, and then just general, um, you know, one, I think there's some things in the PATH Act that really limit the eligibility of, of companies um, of being deemed a small taxpayer because it looks at um, how long you've had gross receipts and they have to be less than 5 million. Now that, that, that 5 million is, is proposed to raise to 10 million, but anything that really would help small businesses monetize the incentive. It doesn't do you know, anybody um, or small businesses um, and, you know, good when they actually can't, can't receive the cash benefit because it's an offset. So anything that would allow small business to monetize that credit, I think is, is probably the most impactful. Um, I think the second is from a broader landscape is the repeal of the 174 amortization um, and to, to not de-incentivize R&D to current to incur in the U.S. So it was interesting. You had been talking about, you know, the various countries, and Australia is one that comes up a lot. Yeah. Um, you want to just kind of comment a little bit on, you know, what, why companies, you know, tend to go to Australia? Well, um, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure most of it is, is probably resources and, and, and where they can do business. But Australia, you know, has, has for, for a number of years, you know, has, has provided a very healthy um, uh, research credit. It's in a form of a credit, just like the U.S. Um, one of the things that, that you know, and it's, it, it, it evolves in maybe stepping back, you know, generally, you know, the U.S. was, was the first. So a lot of the rules, you know, of the four-part tests and, and qualifications a lot of those have been piggybacked by other countries, Canada, the UK, Australia. So what qualifies is very similar. Um, what is different is the cost that qualify and the percentage of the credit that you get um, at the end of the day. The one thing that is unique about Australia is in certain instances, um, you can actually take a credit in Australia for expenditures that occur outside of Australia. So US is very US centric. It has to occur in the US. Some jurisdictions, Australia, Japan, the UK have, um, have um, 
uh, certain rules that allow for, for you to get a benefit for costs that occur outside of that company, outside of that country. Thank you. And because I know it, it comes up a lot and it's important to understand what the differences are. Okay. Um, I have a question from Oliver. So how does the tax credit work for an LLC with R&D expenses exceeding revenue? Is the tax credit applied at the company level or at the loan owner level? And what are other key considerations for LLCs? Yeah, so LLC or any, any pass-through partnership, S-Corp, um, you know, so, so one, the, the research credit is calculated on a commonly controlled group. So any trade or business that's owned uh, greater than 50%, you calculate it as one and then you allocate it out. But for a flow through, that research credit, just like the, you know, taxable income, is passed down to the owners. Um, so, so whoever is is ultimately, you know, the taxpayer in that uh, that ownership change is going to to get and, and, and benefit from the credit. Great. Good. Thanks. Yeah, maybe one other note, mm -hmm. and and we see this um, as a a foot fault sometimes is the, the research credit only offsets regular tax. It does not offset AMT. Um, so you, if you're an AMT taxpayer at an individual level, it unfortunately is not going to, to um, uh, impact that. So putting Andy on the spot. Hey Andy, what do we have to do to get that $5 million limit raised if we're running out of money by January 1st every year? Yeah, unfortunately, there's no interim um, programs that we've done over the last several years. So it really is that only one program that's $5 million that has to be applied for really right up to the minute um, on January 1st. You know, so as you're planning and, and working for, towards the R&D tax credits, the first step is to get qualified under the non-refundable, do all the work that's required there. And once you're in that pool, then you go right into the pool, assuming that you have uh, a tax liability and are qualified on the non-refundable side, then you can go and apply um, through our uh, easy system, and which is, it it's easy to apply, but hard to get, right? Because you have to you know, get your, get your um, application in. And it's, it's, it's seriously a, a, it's, I don't know, the, the thing I would kind of equate it to is like trying to get Phantom Ranch down a Grand Canyon, unfortunately. I mean, when you're looking at trying to get a lottery or, you know, just getting into a, a process with over a hundred different companies applying at the same time. Um, but if you do get approved, then that, then the, the calculations just go through that process. But we haven't, Joan, put any interim um, solutions in place over the last several years. Um, could that happen? Maybe, um, you know, but right now I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing anything like that on the horizon. Um, so really what you're doing this year is preparing for your non-refundable tax credits, get the proper work done. Uh, Jameson's gave a great overview on what qualifies and get into the, um, the sections of the IRS side to get that work done, get approved, qualified through the ACA and the, and the uh, Department of Revenue, and then, you know, um, you know, team up, have a pizza party, some uh, uh, champagne, and get ready for uh, uh, you know the stroke of midnight plus one second. Thanks, Andy. So, Jameson, unfortunately, we don't have you and Andy on speed dial twenty four seven, so. Um, with all of the changes that we are anticipating, right, new administration means new leaders, new regs, new laws. Um, what are some of the best resource sites? I mean, here in Arizona, the ACA, azcommerce.org is, is, is the site, right? That's where they go. But at the federal level, what are some of the best places for them to go for information as things are changing? And are there email um, groups that are hosted either by the IRS or by you know, EY or other organizations um, where they can just kind of get quick blips that say, hey, something changed, you need to know about this. Well, I mean, 
uh, and maybe this is uh, just EY plug here, but I mean, we do offer, you know, several different webcast series. I mean, we have one that's currently going on um, around kind of the Biden um, policy. Um, you know, if you could ever listen to Michael McDaka, who's a partner in our national tax, talk about tax policy, he's phenomenal. Um, uh, and really gives a good picture of what the landscape and what the priorities are. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I would say I, I would definitely plug our, our you know, webcast um, series um, around, around tax policy. Um, and, and Joan, I can provide you some information uh, on that. That would be terrific because uh, we actually have a resource page and that we maintain at AZ Bio so that people can go back and find key resources and we would be happy to post that there. Um, Cause you guys know a lot more about it than I do. Um, so Claudia asks, um, will there be an impact to the Arizona R&D tax credits in 22 when the federal changes change their structure? So, um, Andy, uh, we can both read in on this, but since our statute does tie very closely to the federal statute, I would assume that most of that will probably auto adjust. Would you agree? Yeah, that's, that's been the um, process for the last almost 10 years. So I'm not going to um, suggest that it should be any different. Um, if the federal tax code changes, it'll revert into the proper sections for qualifications of what, you know, qualifies for expenses under R&D. And that would always revert to the federal side, at least through the last 10 years, that's how our leg legislation has been geared. Um, I don't expect to change on that um, process, but that will be adjusted. So when we go through those adjustments, we'll have to, you know, give updates and make sure everyone knows, you know, um, it might be treated a little differently for 2022. Terrific. Sounds like we'll have a, an encore presentation at some point in the future, Andy. Yep. Uh, so um, Mindy asked Jameson, um, at a very high level, when you look at the um, R&D calculation on a regular basis versus the ASC, um, you know, we don't have time to go through the nuts and bolts of how you do it, but what's really the benefit of one versus the other, and why do more people go to the ASC? Yeah, so you know, maybe on the, the previous question, just to, to clarify, because I don't think I mentioned this, even though the deduction versus amortization is changing, that does not impact what qualifies for the research credit. So both federal and Arizona, those costs still would qualify for the research credit. What what current rules allow for is double benefit. You get the deduct right. and you get a credit. Um, from a, a regular versus ASC, um, the, the, the regular um, credit um, was the original. So it uses a metric of gross receipts to what, what is called a fixed base percentage. That fixed base percentage, if you were, um, if you're, a company that existed in 1984 to 88, you're actually using a ratio calculated way back then um, in current. So um, the regular credit does offer a higher percentage. So instead of the 14%, you get 20%. Um, I would think that for most um, uh, companies that, that are maybe in a startup mode, that they might use the, the regular credit versus the alternative simplified. Um, I think most older companies have probably switched over because they can't prove what they did in the 80s. Um, uh, but it is something that they did a few years ago allow more flexibility that really you can switch and pick each year which one you want to do. So it's just something you file on the form as a 6765 that you, it's a real simple form. It only has a few numbers on it. It's the only thing you have to, to provide in your return. Um, but how you fill out that form is, is when you would elect to use one or the other. Okay. 
So we, we've just got a couple of minutes left, um, and I'm looking at the um, the chat. So last call, guys, for any new questions, because I'm going to ask this one. You know, as, as we look at tax preparations for this year and then again next year, um, we had some new tax credit loan programs, you know, that that came into the mix this year. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to complicate things. Um, what is your kind of quick advice to our entrepreneurs, and most of the people on this call are small business owners? Um, you know, what are some things that if you were going to give them three pieces of advice for doing your 2020 and 2021 taxes, what would you say? Talk to your payroll for PPP. <clears throat> I mean, if you got a PPP loan, you may need to make sure you know the change that just occurred, which you can now um, utilize that deduction on your payroll, which wasn't part of it before. So that double benefit is enormous. Um, but that's the one that comes to my mind. It's not tax credit. It's more just I want to get the word out there on this new PPP adjustment. Yeah, I think uh, maybe I'll touch on the, the employee retention credit. So the employee retention credit, you can't double benefit mm -hmm. so that the wages that are, are uh, applied to that cannot be applied to the research credit. So there is some complexity of how you would run that, that calculation. Um, now, you know, there, there is some, some, some thoughts around how you offset that if the if the credit was for non-working time, then that that shouldn't go into the the formula of determining how much of your qualified wages. But uh, it can get a little bit complex, unfortunately. I want to um, really thank both um, Andy and Jameson, as well as Jeff Singleton, for getting us on Jameson's calendar. Um, as we have you know, these important conversations, um, we will be sending out to those of you that were registered some follow-up materials after the event today so that you can have that. Um, we did record this session and I'll go back and um, you know, clean up some of the things um, and have that up for you. So watch your AZ Bio in the loop for further information. Um, but mostly, most importantly, um, the world needs us and we need you to keep innovating and these tax credits are to help you do that so keep innovating enjoy a rainy day in arizona and stay well bye-bye <laughs>